Views expressed and the opinions given by their guests do not necessarily reflect those of the Odyssey Files hosts, its affiliates, or its sponsors. I am Chuck Zukowski from UFONet.com and Alien Highway. I thought I was the only UFO nut until I met Mike and Dave with the Odyssey Files. They're a lot crazier than I am. Oh! Kim, what are you doing? Well, I'm telling Mike and Dave it's time to get on the show. Oh, well, the Odyssey Files starts now. Good evening, paranormal community. Uh, you are watching and listening to the Odyssey Files here on the Iron Range Radio Network and the Cosm Network. Uh, I, <laughs> I'm your host, Michael O'Neill. Uh, not with me until <laughs> just right now. Uh, my co-host, Mr. David Siren. Welcome back, Dave. <laughs> I was hanging out in the green room backstage. I was enjoying uh, all the, the treats and the snacks and the bottled Perrier water and all that fun stuff that you get with the VIP green room treatment. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, for, for for those oh. of you that, for, for for those of you that were watching right at the beginning, like you were just waiting for us to come on uh, on the air, you saw our guest tonight. Um, yeah, who, you did. Who who who, who is the. <laughs> Who is the leading, in, in my opinion, the leading uh, voice in alien cattle mutilations and, and and the like? And that is the great Chuck Sukowski, and he is going to be joining us uh, here in a second uh, for the entire two hours, and we're going to be talking about disclosure and uh, random random alien stuff. Uh, throughout the next two hours. So, um, for you, those of you who, who who are watching, you're more than welcome to put questions into the chat. Um, for those of you who don't know how to watch us instead of listen, you can go to uh, cosm.com, q0sm.com. Uh, you can go to our Facebook page, uh, the Odyssey Files Radio Facebook page. We are going live there along with uh, a, a bunch of other places I probably don't even know. Um, but we're looking forward to it. How about you? Absolutely. I love having Chuck on. He is the walking encyclopedia of everything extraterrestrial as far as I'm concerned. Man, you know, I just, I love, I love when we get a chance to talk to him. And we have, we've had him on numerous times. And it's never, it's never like not a phenomenal show because I always learn something new. And I'm excited, and I don't know if we'll get into it in the first hour, but he's going to talk about something that is new to me again. Yep. Uh, which I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, how much research have we done on UFOs for over the last four years, just to get ourselves up to speed to our guests and people that we've had on, and you know, the books that we read and stuff like that. Did a ton of research, and I, and those, and, and I was into UFOs long before we ever started the show, but. All of that time that I was researching and kind of learning and talking to people and the last four years where we've like intently started investigating stuff, uh, you know, different topics. And he's bringing something to the table tonight that I have not ever heard. Uh, <laughs> except, and so I'm just kind of like, well, there you go. See, that's why you never stop learning and you keep pursuing knowledge because you never know when the hell something new is going to pop up. And so I'm excited to hear what he's got to say about this new topic today. So yeah, uh, it's actually a, a a bunch of new topics and stuff like that that we haven't covered with him ever before. So right, it's it, uh, strap in everybody because it's uh, it's about to get real. So uh, let's welcome to the show, Mr. Chuck Zukowski, for the second time in the last five minutes. <laughs> oh, for the love of Pete! Hey, nice to meet you. Oh wait, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> Oh, oh, there you are. Oh, okay. <laughs> Chuck, next time you come on, we're going to stick to audio. <laughs> no. 
Oh, you miss no. all the great props, man. I like oh, the I like man. the alien. I like the big guy on the wall doing this. Like he's gonna reach out and just grab. I'm gonna get abducted from the light above me, and Chuck is gonna get grabbed from behind and sucked through the wall. Mike's gonna be sitting around doing the show for an hour and forty eight minutes all by himself. That's pretty much. Yeah, the alien in front of the door. I have another one outside the door, and I have an alien over here to to my right, and I, I just surrounded by aliens. I don't know what to tell you. It's my life. <laughs> The, the, well, I suppose that's an alien skeleton then uh, off to yeah. your, what would that be, your right shoulder? It's a Roswell yeah, skeleton. That's that's kind of interesting, that, that skeleton. I guess it's over here. Wait, it's over there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's kind of, yeah, because uh, back in 2000, 2002, so I, I was involved with a couple of uh, uh, excavations or archaeology digs at the uh, Roswell debris site. And um, I had bought that alien, you know, the, I don't know, a couple of years before that. It was just sitting in the office. But I think it was the Sun newspaper. And they came out and said that, uh, that there were some, some archaeologists at the debris site that, that found alien artifacts. And it just had these random people, probably people, you know, that worked for them, you know, at some type of a dick site. And one of them was holding... A skull just like that and it was it was cool because i mean they were talking about us you know and they and they just kind of like you know made up a story and and said we found you know a alien skeletons and stuff but um basically they probably bought that skull from the same manufacturer i bought it from and just kind of threw it in the dirt and went oh look at this you know Ooh. Uh, I, we finally you know, found it yeah yeah do, finally found it how do was, you uh, find that do, do you find that common that you get that like diggers and stuff like that, like mock their own, their own search? Um, you, you talk about people that excavate, you know, they mock. Well, we didn't, we didn't mock. I mean, the sun was the, somehow or another sun, the sun newspaper found out we were there and, and they were kind of like, you know, making something sensational out of it that, you know, we found, you know, uh, skeleton bones of an alien. But in actuality, after that that dig was over, um, the following day after the production crew, because we were shooting for the Sci-Fi Channel, after the production crew left, um, I convinced her. Luckily, you know, he 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 let me do it. But my sister and I came back the following day and did our own dig exactly where we wanted to dig, and not where. The Sci-Fi Channel wanted us to dig in the previous, and you know the people that are in charge of that particular TV show, and we found a, a little piece of metal which was pretty cool. Um, it was it was, was kind of interesting. It's not that I think I'm any better than the people that. Well, of course I think I'm better than the people that were running it because we actually found a piece of metal. What they were doing was uh, we were we were digging in areas, uh, supposedly where the, the craft had skipped and came down, that's okay. But we were digging 70, 80, 90 centimeters in the ground. We were digging two feet in the ground, uh, just way, way too far for uh, something that happened back in you know in the late 40s. And I had done, luckily, uh, my wife and I had, had done some archeology span work with a couple of Anazazi places in New Mexico, just as volunteers. And for something that went back further, you know, you know uh, 800, 900 years, you know, they're only digging down, you know, so deep. So I convinced the archaeologist to let me do a couple of strip digs where we go down, you know, six to nine centimeters. And a strip dig is like a one meter by five meters long. And you kind of just dig in strips and just sift what you're finding or what you're, what you're digging. And after the second strip dig, uh, I'm digging and, and my sister is, is shaking you know, the, the metal grid, you know, sifting out the, the all the dirt. And we found this little tiny, you know, piece of metal. And later on, uh, I had it analyzed and it was aluminum silicon alloy. And then um, a little la later after that, um, I did a press release at you know, Roswell at the Civic Center uh, asking for help from a, you know, a, a credible lab to find out what it actually is. And uh, our, our good buddy, uh, Bigelow, popped up, you know, Bass, who... Um, at the time, I didn't know it, but 
We later found out, you know, when you speed up to 2017, that he was working for the Pentagon. The Pentagon right. was funding him. So at the time, he agreed to to analyze that little piece of metal that we found, or, or I shouldn't say metal, uh, <laughs> aluminum silicon. I guess if it's aluminum silicon, it's a metal alloy. Um, he was being funded by the Pentagon. So as it turns out, the Pentagon was the one that was interested in that little piece that we found more so than Bigelow, which is even more of a cool story. And so anyway, make a long story short, um, the National Museum in New Mexico who housed, who housed the piece, I had them just cut a, a section off and send it to Bigelow. I didn't, you don't ever want to send the whole artifact because you never know if it's ever going to come back. And within the first week, they came back and said, uh, it appears to be an unknown polymer based on the known polymers that are cataloged in the lab. Now, it doesn't mean it's unknown polymer to anything in the, you know, on this planet. It just means it's not a common polymer that, uh, you know, that they had cataloged, which that was great for me because that eliminated aluminum foil, uh, you know, or just uh, stuff from, you know, aluminum foil from like bubblegum wrappers or from cigarette cartons or whatever. Um, and then they said that, you know, the next thing we're going to do is an isotope analysis and see if it's actually from this planet. And that was the last I'd heard of them. Um, and we kind of talk about that in the book, The 37th Parallel. Uh, about a year, uh, almost a year to the day later, they came back and said, oh, it was nothing. We sent the piece back to the National Museum. And I never did actually find out they, if they did send the exact piece back because you know, management uh, had changed at the museum since, you know, I originally had set up the transfer originally, but it didn't matter because I knew that, you know, we had an actual piece left still that down the road, if I ever wanted to reanalyze it, I did have an actual piece left that we found. So that's, it's pretty cool. But anyway, so the sun basically made a mockery of, of our archaeology dig and use that skeleton over there or over there, whatever. And <laughs> it kind of made fun of it. And it was funny. I mean, I, I, I bought it and I bought a couple of copies. I said, hey, that guy's supposed to be mean. That guy's supposed to be that guy. <laughs> it's a made up story, except for what we actually found. You know, I'm thinking when you said the sun, I was thinking like the Phoenix sun. So I'm thinking, well, there, it's a legitimate newspaper, right? So, like, they're reporting on what you guys are doing. So, you know, it's not that far away. You got, obviously, some some major occurrences in Phoenix. But now you're talking about the Sun, which is like Europe's version of the National Enquirer. Exactly. I apologize. Okay. Yeah. All know, right. For people out there that live in, in Arizona. And I was born in Arizona. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, the, the big UK Sun, which it's is their paper. Yeah. 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 It's uh, like, you know. But, uh, you know, a lot of stuff. What's interesting, though, you do learn some things from those type of papers. And it was, uh, you know, the MIB movie, the very first one uh, uh, that came out, they actually made fun of it. You know, they said, well, you know, what are you doing? What we're saying, what's, what, what's happened to the world? They picked up, you know, the National Enquirer or something. Yep. But that is true. It is true. Sometimes you'll, you'll pick up just, inf just information like, okay, this is being done there. You forget about the details because that doesn't tell you anything because it's they don't know. But uh, at least you can look at it and say, "Oh, well, you know, there's crop circle here or or, or whatever." So uh, it's not too far off. I mean, they're the only ones that that publicized our our dig, you know, before the TV show came out. I think it was a documentary came out, so they knew something about it. So, do you still have access to that little piece of metal that's at the museum then, or since ownership has changed, have you been kind of locked out of that? No, no, actually, um, we were going to address that. That was something that I was pitching for the second season of Alien Highway. And um, I had contacted the Maxwell Museum, and it took about two weeks to track it down because it had been cataloged and archived. But, you know, at the last, last I checked, you know, I was able to uh, find it. And, uh, and, and so I know that the original piece or what's left of the original piece is still there. So if I ever want to go back and, and look at it again, uh, and which I do, I really do. I want to go back and, and, and this time, you know, get a lab, a credible lab that is not working for the Pentagon, um, that, that we can go in together in the lab and, and look at stuff, which I thought would be an awesome episode to go in there 
and sit down with the, the lab techs themselves while they're doing the testing on it and then ask them, you know, questions on camera. What are you doing and why are you doing it this way? Because right. people, do, I, I don't know, and I know a lot of the viewers don't know exactly, you know, they just assume, oh, yeah, they're testing it. Oh, what type of testing and what's involved in the testing and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And how long does it take to get the results? And I kind of, you know, pitch that. Um, and then we did get our second season. So uh, next show, next TV show, we'll do it. Yeah, looking forward to that. Um, so you brought up, and this is something I, I thought maybe we would, we would hit in uh, the second hour, but since you, you kind of made reference to it already, uh, good segue. So, and, and that is, and this question was kind of brought into um, our Instagram feed. And um, it had to do with what you thought about how they depict aliens in like movies and TV shows, are are they getting, are they getting like in your opinion the appearance correct, or are they embellishing? They have it completely wrong. Like what 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 is your take on how aliens are are depicted in in the media? I guess you could say. Well, I think I think you know in in TV shows or in, in movies, you know obviously I, I in my opinion Close Encounters the third kind got it right only because Jay Allen Heinrich was their technical advisor and they had, you know, and uh, Spielberg, they say knew a little bit more than, than what he, you know, uh, says he knows. So um, there have been, you know, some TV shows, I think there was one on Fox or something. I forget. I watched a few episodes that it kind of got stupid, but um, the alien actually looked Look like a like a tall gray, um, but you know it's really hard to say because you know um, I can't. I, I know what people tell me that they see, and I personally have never seen an alien. I mean, I've communicated with with a craft of some type that I couldn't see, and I don't know if it was a craft or a ball of light or something. But um, but I've never seen one. So based on eyewitness testimonies, they've seen. Uh, you know, uh, grays, you know, anywhere from four to five feet, you know, tall. And then uh, they've seen reptilians and then they see what we, we call a, the, the tall blondes or the giants or the Nordics, whatever you want to call them. And I, I, Travis Walton, uh, who is really known, I mean, he's pretty popular in ufology as the, uh, the guy who was abducted back in the mid 70s, 75, I think it was. Um, he remembers seeing two species. He saw the grays, and then he saw the, the tall blondes or giants. I, 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 you know, I they call them tall blondes just because they just, just kind of picture like you know um, Edgar Winter, right? You know, right. Edgar Winter and, and and his twin sister or his twin brother, you know, and and they probably are you know in the six eight maybe, you know, six eight close to seven foot, maybe not that tall, but basically. Just under seven feet, uh, extremely strong, but slender. So uh, you know, uh, it's really interesting. And people have seen those. And then you have the other ones where there have been cases uh, where you know the aliens look more gremlin-like, too. So um, you know, it's hard to say what's out there. Gremlin is in like the movie Gremlin, like the little two-foot tall guys with the wide heads. Yeah, I can't remember. I thought it was Kansas. And I, I, I'm sorry, I just, you know, I didn't think about that till just now, but it was a sighting where, you know, these those farmers um, saw these creatures come in and, and just kind of picture them, you know, they, they kind of, they were taller than that. They were probably four feet tall and they had, you know, the gremlin type ears and stuff. And, you know, they looked very gremlin like. Um, that's really like the only other drastically changed, you know, appearance of, of an alien. Now we do, from time to time see you know shadow figures um and and uh, where you really don't you just see a profile and they're more human like but then they could be like something completely different you know not not responsible for stuff that's flying over the u.s but more interdimensional or you know you just you know, they just pop in and, and out when they want so I'm glad you said that interdimensional. So do you think that 
would all right well let's say this would you classify an interdimensional being as an alien or do you think that's too broad of a term and that an interdimensional being is kind of their own category and then like an alien is its own category and like a cryptozoological being let's just say bigfoot nessie champ whatever right like beings like that are their own kind of separate pod or is there a bunch of crossover in this conversation i i I, you know that's a really really good question because uh, um what i try to do at least you know with my understanding is anything outside of this planet is alien to this planet that could be coming in from a craft or interdimensional and um even in an essence or in a sense when a ghost you know investigator communicates with the spirit the spirit is no longer on this plane or in this dimension and really is alien to us even though it's a spirit and and you know we look at it as a spirit and um and then you have the hybrids uh, you know which are part alien and part okay I, I don't really don't want to upset anybody, but you know, I mean, if you look at a at a person who who is part god and part human, that would be, you know, that would be considered a hybrid because that particular person or persons aren't from this planet. They're part of them is and part of them isn't, so that would actually make them a hybrid or alien hybrid. That's just by you know definition, and yeah, and people have to have to understand that. Um, I'm not being uh, disrespectful or anything by saying, oh, Jesus was a hybrid or whatever. What you have to do as an investigator, we have to categorize, like you just said, you know, we have to categorize what people are seeing. It makes it easier for us to try and understand it. If something's not completely from this planet, it's alien-like, even if it's interdimensional. And that would, that would include, you know, ghosts too. So um, it's like the word paranormal, right? Paranormal, for some reason, ghost investigators grabbed that a few years ago, and people, oh, you're a paranormal ghost investigator, you, you investigate ghosts. Well, paranormal, the word paranormal means anything other than normal, which right. would mean everything, ghosts, goblins, you know. Right. Uh, aliens, like, crypto, alien, crypto, zoological like, beings, yep, yep. Right, you know, Nessie, you know, right. anything like that would be considered a paranormal. So um, at one point, I decided I changed from just being a UFO investigator to UFO slash paranormal, just so people could understand. Well, you know, actually, I could just say paranormal, but they would think I'm a ghost investigator still. But right. because there's such, such a wide range of things, um, and we can talk about this a little bit later, too, where uh, there's so, so many things out there that intertwine and interconnect. You know, aliens and ghosts, you know, ghosts are aliens and Bigfoot and, you know, kinds of other things. And there's there's all kinds of parallels. Yeah. Um, so getting into uh, disclosure now for, for, you know, not maybe not everybody knows exactly what we're talking about. Yeah, I know you have the entire report. You, you, I, you I had it too. at. You, you had it at the, the Minnesota Para Unity Convention um, and uh, along with the book that you wouldn't sell anybody, but um, <laughs> not going to let that go. I'm sorry. But um, so I, I, I guess for those who don't really know what it is, I mean, obviously it it's kind of the government's way of I don't want to say exposing, but kind of telling everybody what they know uh, about aliens and UFOs and all this kind of stuff. And we just had reports, what, like a couple months ago come out? June, wasn't it? June 25th, yeah. Yeah. So um, what was your take on what just came out in June? And, you know, like what can people – take away from it as being important and not so important? Well, for, for those people out there that aren't familiar with this or, or, or are familiar, but they'll completely understand how it happened was during the Trump administration, while they were putting together, and I say they because it just wasn't Trump, it was a bunch of other congressmen involved that wanted to get information out and try and figure out what's flying over the U.S. Um, they wanted to get try to figure out some way where, where they could slide something in. Now, now senators, they do it all the time in Congress. 
anytime a bill is 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 passed, somebody from some st some state is going to slide something in there without anybody knowing about it, and you know the you know a few million dollars going to go to you know, you know, fixing something or other in their state, or doing something or other. You know, I mean that's what's going on with Biden right now with his current um, uh, tax release stuff. People don't realize that uh, that he has a death tax involved in his in his recent um, uh, budget document that he's trying to get really some people and, and so right now around the internet people are talking about the death tax where you, if your if your parent dies and wills you the money uh, under normal circumstances you don't pay taxes but under this particular document you would you know so it's not an inherit it's like an inherited tax now so uh, so anyway the same thing happens last year so uh there was the fiscal year 2021 budget that was put together in june of last year and in there was included two paragraphs that basically said um you know when when this budget is released uh you know uh, officially released that the pentagon has six months to uh to at least come out with some type of document uh, you know, preliminary, you know, assessment on, on what's flying over in the U.S. and kind of tell the American public, hey, you know, it, it's been, I've been doing this over 30 years and, and it, you know, and it's been flying over since, uh, well, gee, geez, our, our, our previous pilots are reported were World War II. So uh, it's been going on for a long time. So enough is enough. We want to find out what the gun, what our government knows, and that was embedded in, in this uh, budget. So come to, you know, June 25th, we're all excited. The preliminary assessment, unidentified aerial phenomenon um, document comes out. Now, this is the document that I have and that anybody can read, go online and read. You know, this one is the one that they have two documents. They have one for our eyes only, the public, basically, and then they have one that's, that's uh, classified. So this is the unclassified one. And what's interesting about this, which I thought was really, really cool, is the amount of organizations uh, in the, in our government that actually touched the information, look at the information, or was responsible for giving part of the information of the sightings to the government. And we're looking at the FBI, NRO, AGA, NSA, Air Force, Army, Navy, Navy, ONI, DARPA, I can go on FAA. It goes on and on and on and on. There's about a, a you know, about a, a, almost two dozen different departments that were involved in this. So what was cool was, is they just looked back a few years um, since the pilots, remember the fighter pilots have been reporting these things and they really don't understand, you know, what they're seeing, let alone they can't catch them. Their instruments can't, you know, can't identify them. So they went back just a few years and came up with 144 really good cases where they're going to look at. And out of the 144 cases, 143 fall into this other category, and only one was actually identified. And the one that was identified was a high-altitude balloon that was kind of deflating coming down. Now, the categories, I remember we just talked recently, you know, briefly about categories, how I'm saying that you know, UFO, ufologists kind of throw things in categories. Well, so does the government. You have to, you know, you have close encounters, uh, uh, one and close encounters of the you know, second kind or the third kind. Then there's a fourth kind. There's even a fifth kind now. So even, you know, we throw things in, in categories. So with the government, they threw them in categories. The first one was airborne clutter. That would be balloons or that would be, you know, just uh, birds, or, you know, a flock of birds or something. Not the band of flock of seagulls, but not like a flock of birds. Um, the second one was the natural atmospheric phenomenon. This was a good one because a lot of people, when they see lenticular clouds, they look like flying saucers. And they say, it's a flying saucer, it's hiding inside it. No, it's a lenticular cloud. We see them all the time here in Colorado due to different atmospheric conditions. That throws in, you know, sprites, crystals, you know, weather crystals, all kinds of stuff. Maybe ball lightning may fall into that. Um, then you have the USG or industry development. That category would be the black ops projects, you know, the skunk work projects. Now, supposedly, our government 
the people who, who researched all the sightings, you know, the 144 sightings, they were able to at least ask, hey, is this a black ops project or not? I mean, you know, if it is, we'll remove it or whatever. None of that came up. Now, I'm not saying that's not entirely going to be valid because I know personally that within our government, there's there's divisions that just won't talk to each other. This one's off its, on its own. And you can, you can, you know, matter of fact, a lot of people don't even know this one exists. So then you have another category, which is foreign technology, basically our foreign adversaries. That would be China or, or, or Russia with their top secret stuff. And so they would look at that too and say, to the best of our knowledge, our experts are, uh, you know, that know foreign technology says that's not foreign technology. So the last one is other, which is anything. It's, you know, if, in other words, other means UFO. It's an unidentified. Uh, but they don't want to put other, I mean, they don't want to put UFO in, in a document because of, you know, or UAP because the media would have a field day with it. So they just came up with other. But come on, really? If you throw something that is completely unidentified to you into the other category, it's really in the identified, unidentified category. But what's cool about this is part of that document says that first off, our fighter pilots with the best technology that we have, and, and um, I'm a microchip designer, I'm an IC mass design engineer, so I've been on projects where, where uh, we design rad hard devices technology for, for fighter jets and, and also for commercial airplanes and then uh, space stuff too. So uh, I'm a contractor, so I've worked with different companies. The thing is, is the best technology that we have on our fighter jets to be able to go against our adversaries or go against, you know, whoever, uh, that technology cannot identify what the pilots themselves are seeing. So they may have IR, they may have audio, they may have LIDAR systems, you know, infrared. Nothing shows up. And the computer just says it's unidentified. It's just, I don't know what it is, I can't identify. And then on top of that, the objects that they're seeing move so quickly that they it actually defies the laws of physics as we know it. Because if an object moves that quickly, if it had an occupant inside, the G-force would be so extreme that you would die. I could show you a picture on my phone of uh, when I was a deputy. I was a volunteer deputy for eight years out here in Colorado. And I worked at an airplane crash site. It was a, a twin engine Cessna with two pilots. Both of them extremely experienced. Uh, both of them ex you know, instructors. One was getting his his instructor, you know, recertification from the other one. The plane dropped straight down, which is very unusual. So if they hit, must they hit a, an air pocket or something? Had no lip, came straight down, hit the ground, and when it hit the ground, it bounced about four feet and kind of turned a little bit, right? Now, by the time I got there, the coroner had already pulled the bodies out. But I you know, hate to say it, but the, the G-force, the impact of that airplane hitting the ground, everything inside their bodies came out. Yeah. And when I, when I looked inside the cockpit, it was, it was I, I don't want to describe it, but it was terrible. It was and, just painted, and, painted red is what it was, well, right? I mean, it no, it was painted red, we'll just say it looks like spaghetti noodles. Yeah. 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 So how do you, so I got a quick question because I know we're going to, and you move rapidly. So I just want to throw this in there. So what's your, since you were at that site, how could you explain, what do you think that Cessna was flying at? Like for a certification, like, is there a minimum that you have to fly? Is there, I mean, what are they? 1500 feet, 2,500 feet, somewhere yeah, in there? Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Okay. Yeah. About 2, All right. So, yeah. Okay, so they're cruising at two thousand feet. Both really, both intelligent. Both a lot of time behind the the flight stick, right? Mm -hmm. Getting his recertification for an instructor. Do you legitimately think that they hit an air pocket that they just dropped two thousand feet and never got the lift back in that two thousand foot window? Does that because that just to me, my brain does not compute that. That I was in a, in a commercial airliner where we hit an air pocket like that and we dropped enough that the air masks came out. And everybody lost their mind, right? And that was going over the Rockies, flying from Chicago to uh, to Phoenix. So, but we didn't drop two thousand feet, I don't think. But I mean, in a Cessna, 
It doesn't weigh as much as a commercial airliner does, obviously, so it wouldn't fall as fast. I just can't understand how there wouldn't be some lift in there where it would just come down perfectly, hit the ground, bounce, spin, and then like come back. It just doesn't compute, I guess. You 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 would you would think you would actually think, and and I and I've thought about that for a while and researched it and talked with an air um, uh, helicopter pilot, and the helicopter pilots experience that a lot, and. Uh, you know, where they hit an air pocket and then there's just no lift. You just fall. Most of the time, you're just going to glide down. But this one came straight down, which was I thought was pretty unusual. That's but I guess it, it could happen. Now, I flew at that airport. Um, I took some, some flying lessons. And so I flew a single, uh, I was a piper, a single engine piper around there. And we're already at 64, 6,500 feet here. So we only go up another 15, you know, 1,500, maybe 2,000, because that puts us, you know, at 8,000 feet. Right. Um, now, the airplane itself doesn't know that 2,000 feet below us is land, because the altimeter right. says, well, well, you know, because it's based on sea level, right? right? So we're right. at 65. So you have to adjust it to say, you know, the ground level is 2,000 feet below us. So if they were at 1,500 feet and they hit a complete air pocket, yeah, they could absolutely drop. My question to... But you would glide, uh, right? Because yeah. you, you got momentum oh. moving forward. You hit the air pocket. You're still going to... Okay, so you're losing altitude, but you're still gliding in the direction you were going originally as, right. your, as your momentum is going to carry you. Right. You're not just going to dead drop. Right. And the only thing that um, I suggested um to the you know to the the, the investigators that were there because you know they're looking at this and i'm just being a goofball you know you know walking around you know as it's a crime scene and um i said that it almost looks like one of two things that you know they were they were knocked down or for whatever reason they decided to go up and then then it would have came down like this Right, you would have yeah. stalled potentially and then just drop tail and drop flipped down. and then come down. Yeah, yeah. Come straight down in an air pocket. Right. And and it was interesting because the one guy said, huh, yeah, yeah, I guess that could actually happen. I'm worried. And then, and then I'm walking around the airplane and the tail of the airplane, okay, the back tail had a scrape mark across it. And, and I said, and I pointed that out to him. I said, uh, does does that look unusual to you? You know, uh, you know that the, the tail fin of the airplane's got a scrape on it, as if something might have scraped against it. Yeah. And the, and the guy walked over, and looked at it, and he goes, "Huh." I'm like, you know, he looked at me, and goes, "How do you know so much about you know these type of investigations? You worked in before?" I'm like, "I'm a UFO investigator," <laughs> you know. And he kind of just kind of laughed and shrugged his head, you know, kind of walked away. But you know, I've been I've been involved in so many types of investigations. You got you, you don't look at the obvious, and that's what they were looking for. They were looking at the obvious. They were checking the fuel in the engines to see if the engine, you know, had ran out of fuel and looking for fuel in the turbines and 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 everything everything that they saw that day, disassembling parts while I was there, and I was there for 10 hours. Um, the engines were running. The engines were running when it came down. So um, very well, that unusual. Makes, that makes no sense. It makes absolutely no, it makes no sense. sense no. Yeah. But um, and I tried. I tried a little bit later to to find cause of death. I couldn't find anything um, in the news. And of course, um, if it's if it's unknown, uh, you know, uh, this, you know, it's they're not going to release. So we don't know what it is. You know, at that point, I mean, they're still trying to find that other airplane. Uh, you know, the the, the airline that, that disappeared went off a radar a couple of years back. They don't know yeah. where you know, what happened to it. And that's all they're going to say. We, we don't know what happened. But, you know, we do live in, in, we don't understand, we think we understand, and even the best scientists we have are pretty sure they understand the physics of the planet we live in. But that's not true. Because, you know, you can only understand what you know. And if you don't know it, you don't understand it because you don't know it yet, right? right. So there's a lot of things out there that we really don't understand yet about this planet because it hasn't, we haven't come across it yet. It hasn't been addressed to us yet, like like the UFOs, you know, or UAPs that have been flying over the U.S. The interesting thing about this particular document, which is really really cool, is 
in the document, the Pentagon is asking for a budget for funding to create, not to build, to create technology to be able to identify what the fighter pilots are seeing. Not, not just to make a, a cup, you know, and say, okay, here you go. No, to actually invent technology. So now they have to sit here and think about what type of technology can I invent, you know, to, you know, to try and identify what our pilots are seeing, what our pilots can't keep up with. And we're talking G-Force. So the whole purpose of, of the airplane scenario is, is exactly what I said. If the impact of the Gs that that airplane hit the ground, everything came out, right? right. I actually right. found my right. I found a liver next to, next to the you know the, the right side of the plane outside, and I had to bag that and take it to the coroner's office later. And I'm not really you know, I wasn't really trained for anything like that, so I was kind of you no know, corner around it. So I just had to do it on my own. But um, when I called the coroner. That's what he told me to do. <laughs> he says, "Oh, just pick it up, bring it in." I'm like, well, okay. Um, so, if you think about that impact and the amount of g-force. Think about the stuff the pilots are saying where it's flying and all of a sudden it goes, boop, you know, or moves. And that movement so quick at that rate of speed, you know, if it be 800 miles an hour or 1,000 miles an hour or whatever, anything that was human would just be a center, just be a mess, right? Just yeah. what, what I thought. Not only that, but we don't have the metal technology. We don't have the, you know, alloys that can, that can do that. Even our submarines, you know, they have to stay, you know, they have to have some type of atmosphere inside of the submarine pushing against the, you know, the inside walls because you have the, the pressure in, in, in the ocean pushing. Right. And so that's, so they have to keep it pressurized or else the submarine would, would you know, would implode, right? Pretty much. It would implode, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So when you look at it that way, and people go, well, yeah, I can see that turning. Well, you have to think about, we can't do that. You know, we don't have the technology to do that. And we don't, we don't even have the technology to identify what these, you know, these pilots are seeing. And I mean, I think it was Commander Fravor actually said, you know, he's been a fire pilot for years. He goes, this is violating our physics. I've never seen anything, you know, and self, you know, the self if planes, you know, remember the, the F-11, uh, 7A, right? They call it the wobbly goblin. Pilots really couldn't fly it because it was so hard to fly. They had to be fly, you know, flown by a computer. And then later on, they were able to fly them together. So some of these stealth planes are, are so hard to fly that computers have to fly, but it's still our technology. Not only that, they can't even find exhaust. There's there's no exhaust, no infrared exhaust, no heat exchange, nothing. Nothing was picked up. It's a really cool report. And I'm really surprised that the media really didn't push it more than they did. It's almost as if the media just was told, okay, you had your little field day, back it off of it. So, so we have to rely on podcasts like yours. That's what we're here for, buddy. Did you have a question, Mike? Because I got a question. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I was just going to ask. Now, I mean, I, I know that I said, you know, what's important and what isn't. But is there anything in that report that you found surprising? Uh, no, not really. Because I was expecting, you know, as an investigator, I always ex expect, I don't expect the unexpected. I always expect what's obvious. And and if you if you go do an investigation and you find out yeah that was an airplane that guy saw I'm not all bummed out you know it's when you, you go through it you go oh my gosh it's really cool you know you, you don't want to hype yourself up to do something uh, and be let down so you you, know, you kind of like try and stay you know at a certain level and that's how it was with I knew they wouldn't say you it's UFO or aliens for guys they couldn't say that you know we can't handle a COVID virus without you know buying out the store with you know toilet paper and paper towels and everything else could you imagine if people found out that we had aliens flying over the u.s the hoarders would just go crazy and then the people that that are transporting the food 
would become hoarders too. Hell, we we would lose trucks full of food, go to the black market, market, all kinds of stuff. And we actually saw that with, with toilet paper and paper towels being sold on the black market. Uh, masks too. So and it's sanitizer. not something that and sanitizer big time. So yeah. it's not any you know, we learned in the past year and a half what could happen. You know, but but now let's step it up from a virus to to something completely, completely unknown that we have no control over. At least with the virus, we have a control over with, with the, you know, the medical industry, you know, designing vaccines, you know, working on it, you know, but how do you work on, you know, an alien flying over, you know, you just wait next time you see one fly over and hope they don't stop and check you out. <laughs> now, the only thing, wave back the as they though, continue to go, right? Yeah. Hey, it was good to see you. Hey, you too. Keep hey, going. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Nice, have a nice flight, man. Don't bother stopping here. You don't want to come here. It's just boring down here. <laughs> That's right. And um, yeah, because you don't want to wake up two hours later and your butt sore, so you don't <laughs> want to go there. No. But, no. <laughs> but the one thing that did surprise me, though, uh, David, was 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 the fact that they said that 143 fell into the other. I thought they were going to identify a lot more than the cases that they had. So that was a shock to me. Right there, wow! Out of 144, and and I mentioned all the different departments that were involved in this, and who looked at this, and da 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 da. Um, you could only identify one. Okay, not only is that way cool, but that's that is the first step. This is the first step to the disclosure. Now, the only thing that could, they could pull out of this is to say, okay, it turns out it was. You know, it was a black ops project, and they've been doing it for years now, and, you know, oh, at least three, four decades, and, and it's not aliens, and this and that. And then, and then at that point, the media, or, or not the media so much, us, we will have an effing field day because then we're going to say, uh, excuse me, if you have, if we have, you have the technology of anti gravity, of non petrol. Uh, you know, type of, of fuel system that that won't hurt our, our earth, you know, and that won't won't give us smog, clean energy stuff. And you've known about it for four decades, and you haven't released it. That is going to be, you know, you want to talk about a civil war, man. People are going to go off the edge with that. Meaning, really, you know, how many people have died due to, you know. Uh, Lung cancer due to you know, or, or smog, or, or or you know, floods, and anything that had to do with with uh, you know, climate change. If we have something that can eliminate climate change, free energy, and we're still burning fossil fuels because someone's making money off of it, and you know, you know what I mean? Um, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to go away real quick. Yeah. So I don't know what's worse. It's probably better for them to say say <laughs> if they want to live. I'm, I'm curious, Chuck, uh, in your opinion or from your research, your knowledge, okay, of the 144 cases that were chosen for this report, how many of those are available for, like, public scrutiny? Like, how many of those cases could you and I and Mike request and have, them, and have those cases disclosed to us where we could go through it with our set of eyes, with our knowledge, with our and see what we see. I think John Greenwald from the Black Vault is already doing an FOIA on it. Okay. When I went to his Black Vault when it got released, he um, he was doing a freedom of information to find out exactly. Now we do know some of the sightings because you know they were released you know to the stars or you know right. They, you know, a lot of the stuff that we we physically seen on TV off of the aircraft carriers right. uh, off of San Diego then you know, in the Atlantic also. That's part of them. So at least of those we could look at and 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 research those. And there's other ones that have been reported before, but that's you know, that's a really good point. There was nothing in it that says these were all the cases, da 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 da. Now that some of those cases that are most likely the ones that that are unidentified are in the you know the secure documents, the classified ones. Um because since they don't know what it is, you know, they, they may not release the details to that to the public. Right. 
Yeah, so I mean, there there might be some other issues too. But the last I checked, and it's been a while ago, you know, just after this got released, because we had talked about, okay, what are all the cases? And right. I and I remember John Greenwald was looking into that. So and this is know, all this is U.S. Like airspace, all. right? This is only U.S. Yeah. airspace. This is U.S. Not, airspace. not worldwide. Okay, right. So no, you've got no, all the weird shit that's going on in South America and in Russia and Europe and stuff like that. That's all. Like they would have to take it upon themselves to put together a report similar to this to make kind of a worldwide disclosure. So right now I mean, we're only discussing U.S. disclosures. Yeah, I think Brazil did at one point, a couple decades ago or so, some type of report like that. But um, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. And out of the 144 cases, that's just the ones that were reported, or that's just the ones that they wanted to talk about. Right. You know, um, out of I mean. Theoretically, only maybe 35, maybe 40 percent of the sightings are actually reported, and that's and, and I'm giving that, you know, I, it's probably less than that. I was being yeah. generous with that, so you know, we can safely say maybe 25 percent of the reportings are our sightings are reported, which means you know there could be 70 percent or 65 percent of stuff that people saw that are never reported. Okay, so, you know, take that 144 and, and, and times it by 60%. And then that's, the pilots saw it or, remember for a long time there, fighter pilots would see stuff all the time and never reported it because they didn't want to be ridiculed. They didn't want to, you know, there, there, was, there was a problem with that. And so, and- Well, they'd have, lost pilots, their, they'd have lost their job. Yeah, and even fighter pilots, they were afraid of losing their they were afraid of losing their rank and or losing their position. So they're just oh. like, whatever. I saw it, you saw it, right? Like two or three of us were in the air, we saw it, we followed it, but we're not talking about it. Right? It's just something yeah. we're taking to the grave. That's yeah. right. And I've talked to a couple different fighter pilots, a few actually, in in, in my career, from helicopter to you know, to jet fighters of that um going back as far as Vietnam. And they all have a story of seeing something, everyone that I've talked to. And I always say, you report it? He goes, hell no, I'm not gonna record it. You know, they boot me out or they, or they, or they derank me or whatever. Yep. And the same thing with commercial pilots too, you know, or they would go under a psychological assessment or, or whatever. So um, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of sightings that, you know, the pilots have seen that have never been reported. Now. If we look at that, well, we just look at, at the 144 times 60 percent of the ones that weren't reported. But then again, now you have to look at okay, what about all, the, all those sightings that we're never seeing, right? That stuff that's flying out there that that we never notice. No one ever thinks about that. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff out there that that that's flying around. But you know, you just have to. Someone just got to you know stay looking up or stay looking in different directions. Now, I'm in Colorado Springs, and I'm surrounded by Space Force now. Um, Schriever Air Force Base, um, I think it's uh, uh, Peterson and, and then Cheyenne. They're all part of, of Space Force now. And you know, so here in Colorado Springs, you know, we call it the Space Force Triangle, especially my house, because I'm like right in the middle. I'm right in between Cheyenne Mountain and Schriever Base, pretty much. So um, Space Command has been, has been you know, for years and years and years out of NORAD have been tracking bogeys. They used to call them Santa Claus, just for, you know. And it's funny because when I first moved to Colorado Springs 20 some, not 21 years, 22 years ago, um, about, about just, I tried to get into to, to NORAD to get into the, to the, the mountain of NORAD, but at the time, you know, for whatever reason, they wouldn't let me in. I wouldn't let anybody in to tour it. So Go figure, I can't imagine life. why. Yeah, I can't either. That's yeah. a, that's absurd. That's absurd. So so I got a PowerPoint presentation. I got to go through the front gates to to like the visitor center, sit down to a PowerPoint presentation, and you could see off a distance the opening into NORAD, which was cool, but that's as far as I get. So uh, it's funny because the person doing the presentation, he's just talking to a bunch of you know Yahoos, including me. And he goes, "Any questions?" And I go, "Yeah." And he's Santa Claus sightings. Outside of December, <laughs> you know, because Norad tracked Santa Claus, you know, on the twenty fourth. But um, and he kind of looked at me, 
Hey, the next question. <laughs> I mean, he knew what I was talking about, but he didn't, you know. He, I, instead of just saying, you guys ever, you know, track UFOs, I asked him, you know, you ever track Santa Claus outside of December, you know. But he can't didn't. imagine why you weren't allowed in, Chuck. I, I'm confused. I just don't, I don't get it. So, <laughs> yeah, well, that's okay. That's okay. You know, well, you know, they can, they know a lot more, obviously, than they can say. Because right. we're bound to, to secrecy. I mean, I've worked on a couple of projects that you know I, I, I'm still bound to secrecy. I can't talk about, you know, just because you know they're military projects, or they're also projects with commercial companies. Right. Uh, one project, way way cool, and I wish I could talk about it, but you know, maybe five years from now you'll know about it. But uh, so that's just commercial. Now you have these guys in the military that have, you know, TS, top secret. And then there's different levels in the top secret. So, uh, you know, they wouldn't even say what I just said. Oh, I know something. They would never say that. They would just say, uh, I'm not in that department. I don't know. You know. <laughs> so, they're, you know, I, and then, yeah, anyway. I'm curious, it, just staying on the same kind of type, because I, I can't get this whole this plane that crashed that kind of hit the air pocket out of my mind. So when you saw that scrape on the tail section, do you think it's possible that like take that home with you? Like that tail section home with you? Like there <laughs> might have been metal to metal evidence left, like some type Absolutely. of object. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Like, Because if it, if it hit, wouldn't you get some rub off or whatever of whatever the metal was that hit the other metal that caused the damage. So do you think well, that they ever looked for that? Or do you think that they just threw this one under the rug and were like, yeah, it's just a bad accident. It, whatever, you know, cause did you ever hear what the final reason was? No, I know no, I did. No, I didn't. And I looked again a couple of years ago. Um, but you know, um, some of this information is not as readily available on the internet anymore as it right. was before. There was a lot of stuff back in the internet when the first internet came out, you know, uh, that we could look up, and a lot of it's been removed from the internet. We actually had a law on the books that you could look up when the internet first came public. Uh, to where you can get into government documents and university documents and stuff. We would do an FTP, a file transfer protocol. You know, you have to remote in, remote right. log into a university or a government facility, and we did have a law at one point. That said, that the United States government can use the citizens of the United States, States as guinea pigs legally. There was a law, you know, that that stated that. And then uh, I think if you if you search hard enough, you'll probably find the reminiscence of that um, of that law. And there was also another one called the uh, the Disclosure Act, and I forgot if it was the Disclosure Act of forty seven or forty eight, and 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 basically. Um, that particular document talked about how um, the media or the the the, mil the government or the military would feed false could feed false information legally to the media to um, um, you know to to keep people from seeing certain or, or thinking about certain things. Now, what's cool, and I've always talked about that um, that. Um, Gosh, what was it? Was what it really called the Non Disclosure Act? It was called something else. Um, but anyway, I remember talking to with my wife, and of course, my wife's a skeptic. But I was there with a, with my family, and I said, you know, there's this act out there that the government is allowed to pull stuff out of our media and remove it, so we don't know about it. And she said, yeah, yeah, right, right, right. You know, so. We're at Los Alamos, and, and I'm watching. We're sitting down in a little movie theater. And we're watching this black and white, you know, film on you know um, the creation of the atomic bomb, and and it was done years and years and years, you know, decades ago. And so we're watching this old, like, uh, you know, like I don't want to say it's super eight, but it's sort of something like that, right? And and at one point they're talking about fat. Is it? Fat man, and anyway, I forget the name already of the, yeah, the two. Fat, fat man, and a little boy. Yeah, fat man, and a little boy, and um, and there was and there and the announcer or not the answer, the MC of it was boasting about how 
they, the government, or the people involved in this military, pulled words out of the Buck Rogers comic books. They pulled the word atomic and nuclear and certain words they pulled out of the comic books. So no one would know that we're working on the atomic bomb. And I'm going, see, see, and I look over at my wife and she's asleep. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so even to this day, she goes, ah, they didn't say that. But, you know, <laughs> she thought it was boring to her and I was like really excited watching this. Um, you know, because my background is technology and, and you know, that, that stuff kind of, um, I was a nerd in high school too. But clearly, you know, um, during during the creation of atomic bomb, words were pulled out of the media. And I'm sure they, there still is. Uh, years ago, I was talking to a reporter and I made a joke about how there were certain words you, was there certain words you really can't say in a news report? He goes, oh yeah, yeah, there's, there's words that we, you know, that get removed, certain things we can't talk about. We maybe will talk about a particular subject, but certain words you can't talk about. Now that was probably about ten years ago, and maybe it's still going on. Especially now with, well, now within the past few years, it's become so political that there's certain information that certain news, you know, casters won't even talk about because it's right. it would be negative to to their you know political point of views, right? Right. Right. So we we see that. So yes, mm -hmm. you've stuff to pull away from us, and so it's it's up to us, it's up to podcasts like yours, these these radio shows like yours, to get information out to the public, because that's the only way we can talk. And it, it's not going to disclosure if, if the government decides, you know, okay, you know, we're just going to can this thing, um, and Facebook and and you know Twitter and them, you know, who are already, uh, you know, they're already. You know, pulling pulling information off off of, of individuals who are trying to you know exercise the First Amendment, and they come up with these goofy, you know, well, you know, that's this or that's that, and you can't say that. Well, you see all these all these large companies, you know, they're they're all controlled too. So uh, especially if they if they want to keep their government contracts or you know the federal contracts, so there's certain protocols that they have to follow too. So we have to rely on, on podcasts. And as long as the internet doesn't become, you know, uh, controlled, and it is kind of already, but controlled, where we wouldn't be able to do a podcast like this without the podcasters going out. You know, we, once we start talking about a subject, all of a sudden, you know, it's off the air. I mean, they can do that satellite and stuff, but, uh, you know, internet, they would have to, you know, it'd have to be something more dramatic, like, you know, the whole section of the internet would have to collapse. Oh, well, maybe not. Maybe I could just kill, you know, your, your live feed to me. So I'm sure they oh, probably could. I, we'll find I a way, you were going, I, I I thought you were going with that sentence, like they could just kill us and not no, kill the no, feed. Because, but. No, you know what? I, I've been, <laughs> I've been a, addressed a, about that a few times throughout my career of doing this. Aren't you afraid of just you know, going up missing. Now, it does happen. There's been, sure. you know, past two, three decades, there's been some UFO investigators that were, that died mysteriously, not really mysteriously, but just by coincidence, you know, right. run off the road, you know, hit by a car. Now, coincidence, maybe, unless you, unless you dig deeper like we have and know what they were investigating at the time. And um, and and I always like to bring up Max Spears. If you look up Max Spears, S P E E R S, he was a Polish uh, uh, UFO investigator, and he sent a text message to his mom. He says, "Mom, I, I stepped over the line. I, if something happens to me or whatever, you know, go public or or do something." And I think I forget if it was a week later or three days later. He was found dead in a in a motel room or something. He had black ooze coming, black liquid coming out of his mouth. Yep. And those are those are the cases where, if you know something, and you're asked to keep quiet about it, I keep quiet about it because there's so much other stuff that we can release. You know, because what you're doing now is not. You will. You know, they will control you at one point. You know, if 
if if I get a phone call and say, hey, Chuck, I don't want you talking about that anymore, you know, because, you know, you know those taxes you, you owe to the federal government right now? We'll quadruple that, you know, or we'll do this or we'll do that. Like, now you got to think of your family. You got to think of the outcome. You got to think of a lot of stuff. So do you look at your pride or do you think of the reality of what, how it can affect not only you? If you're all by yourself and you don't have a family, you have nobody, you're an orphan, go for it. You know, the worst going to happen is, you know, they're off you. But, you know, when you have... So <laughs> you, wake, you wake up with a bunch of black ooze pouring out of your mouth in a motel room and nobody yeah. knows why. Yeah. And I, and I remember I've talked to you guys before about, you know, our, uh, yeah, I've got a couple of phone calls in my career from someone within the government asking me specific questions. And I'm very polite. I answer the questions. I don't lie to them. I give them any information they want to know. And if they want more information, I say, call back. You got my number. Anything else you want to know, just let me know. And if you need any help, <laughs> I always yeah. throw that at the very end. If yep. you need help, I'll be, I'll be more than help, you know, happy yep. to help you. Yep. And the, the thing yep. is, yeah, there's, there's there's divisions in the government, in my opinion, that are that are contradicting each other. There's one that's a kind of like keep stuff completely under the table, under the rug. There's another section that's just trying to get the information out to the public. And um, but there's so much going on. That if I was told, okay, look, you're not going to, we don't want you to investigate that. Okay. All right. I won't investigate that. I'll remember it. I'll remember what you told me. And I'll keep that in my file, in my head of, of anything that I, I come across that is exactly like what you told me not to investigate. Realize that either you're already investigating, there's some type of connection between the government and whatever it is I was going to investigate. Now, as an investigator, there's just so much other stuff. We can go around that. You know, you know, if, if, if there's a parked car in the middle of the road, you're not going to hit it, right? You're going to you're going to go around the parked car, you know, car, maybe go off on the shoulder and still get to your destination. Right. Or, you know, you'll have to take an off ramp and maybe not get to the exact destination, but eventually you'll get there. You'll just get there with a different route. It'll take a little bit longer, but you'll be allowed to do it. Well. Wow. Speaking of routes we don't really want to take, we have to go to commercial. So just leave, leave it to the media. I mean, there you go. So, uh, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll be back here in just a couple of minutes with our guest, Mr. Chuck Zukowski, where we will be uh, talking about some interesting alien topics. So, uh, all right, we'll be right back. See you on the other side. Hi, Tom Bodette. If you can hear me, then you have an internet connection, which means you can do cool things online, like listen to streaming radio, obviously, or watch a video of a monkey washing a cat. Let your freak flag fly. Or you can book a room at a great price at motel6.com. Isn't the internet wonderful? Everything you want right at your fingertips and, whoa, did not need to see that. <clears throat> I'm Tom Bodette from Motel 6, and we'll leave the light on for you. Unexpected reactions to smart financial decisions brought to you by FeedThePig.org. Well, I finally did it. My student loan is totally paid off. I can't believe it. I can't believe it either. I paid more than the minimum each month, and soon enough, it was gone. So you're just giving up. Giving up on what? The life of luxury. Egyptian cotton, caviar Thursdays, designer everything. What are you talking about? Our plan. What happened to winning the lottery and mastering the art of the perfect mimosa? Hosting galas, wearing enough jewelry to require a bodyguard, vacationing in the French Riviera, and then buying it. I just thought maybe it was time to prepare for my future. You know, set some financial goals, make some smart investments, open a 401k. Financial goals? Investments? A 401k? You are horrified right now. Listen, if winning the lottery were easy, everyone would do it. When it comes to financial stability, don't get left behind. Get tools and tips for saving at feedthepig.org. This message brought to you by the American Institute of CPAs and the Ad Council. Northern Tool and Equipment. So me and the boys head out to tailgate today and find some other fans in our spot. Well, it happens. Yeah, cheering for the wrong team. Oh, this is war. Even worse, they've got this 
couch set up and everything. A couch? Yeah, it's a sectional. All right, first thing, don't ever use the word sectional again. Done. Second, I want you to grab a 4,700-pound tow chain with J-hook and grab hammer. Throw that on the back of your truck. Got it. Now you're going to hail Mary the J-hook over the end of that couch. Time to find a better spot for your new friends. That should do it. There's no problem. A little horsepower can't solve. Northern Tool and Equipment. Taking a family of five to the amusement park can cost a small fortune. Oh, yeah. So to save some money, we thought, hey, let's bring the amusement park to us. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. Uh, step right up. Step right up, young man. Are you ready to ride the wacky waterfall? That's just the bathtub with the shower head running. Nope, it's the wacky waterfall. It's the shower, Dad. Waterfall. Wacky. There's an easier way to save. To get a free rate quote, go to geico.com. Then buy online, over the phone, or at your local Geico office. Green light. Hey, girl. School zone. I'm getting hungry. Car changing lanes. You want to meet me for pizza? Stop sign. Intersection clear. Yeah, street. Pizza sounds good. Ball in street? Girl in street! <gasps> It's hard to concentrate on two things at once, like texting and driving. Stop the text, stop the wrecks. How will you stop texting and driving? Tell us at stoptextstoprex.org. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Hey, it's Chris Fleming. Listen to Dave and Mike on Odyssey Files, because if you don't, you're going to get abducted. Ah, that didn't work. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, apparently, yeah. Oh, that's all right. Apparently, uh, <laughs> you had more. Are you going to hold Chris. that the whole rest of the show? <laughs> no. Oh, I don't see anything. But. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's because you're old, Dave. What? Never what? mind. So Chuck's, Chuck's frozen. I can't. All I see is Chuck holding an alien bald baby in the blue uh, pajamas. That's it. Well, that, that's actually all he is doing. So that's all right. no, he's he's frozen, like on my screen oh. anyway. I can hear well, him, but not I, he's not. He's not moving. There he is. Not to me. So he he's fine. He's just doing stuff. Any. He... <laughs> Anyways, so uh, this past Wednesday, you came on uh, the Odyssey Hour, which is the thing that the, the the hour thing that I do with my my paranormal team every Wednesday night on the Odyssey Paranormal Society Facebook page, and you like I, I can't even remember remember exactly what the question was. I mean, it was obviously something about. Um, about aliens. I believe Haley had asked it and you had an answer. I was not expecting like at all and had never heard of it. Nothing. And and I told it to Dave, you know, uh, the other night and he was like, no, <laughs> what? That doesn't make any sense. Right. So you, you had a classification you know, you had like a, a, a hierarchy of, of like the, the, the alien race that had four different stages. And I'm not even going to give this away a, a as to what the, the added thing was, but why don't you go over that again? Okay. And you're going to have to probably brief me on, on what I added that kind of, you know, made you go, what? Because, uh, you know, I, I just pulled this stuff out as, as you asked me these questions. Um, and uh, no, I'm not making it up. So what? <laughs> and, and you'll know if I make this up because if I if I if I tell you it again and it's different, you're like, oh, I made it up. So I had talked to. Um, uh, I live in the Four Corners area here in the United States, so uh, I have the opportunity to be able to communicate with people involved in in. Uh, you, you tribe, Navajo tribe, um, uh, Apache tribe. And um, I was talking to, I, I, it was a couple of years apart, but I remember talking to one of the, I, I can't remember if it was Navajo first, 
uh, Navajo elder who uh, whose job is to uh, retell the stories, the history of, of the tribe. You, you know, they, and yeah, she was writing some of this stuff down, but there, but everything is kind of brought down through the generations. And we were talking about aliens and how some people, I guess these emails from people saying, there's 50 different types of aliens on this planet. Really? Send me a picture of one, you know? <laughs> or, 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 you know, I always get asked too, how many aliens are actually visiting this planet? I go, I really don't care. I just, I'm just trying to find one. And if we find one, we'll, we'll, we'll look for their cousins or whoever, you know. But so we're, we're kind of talking about that. And and I think it was the Navajo tribe. There was basically this lady, lady the elder was telling me that there's four dips in different species of aliens that we would consider aliens on this planet. Or beings. I shouldn't say aliens, but beings. Um, because two of them may not really be aliens. And one of them was the blues. And the they the, the blues, um, I believe, are the ones that that come out of the mountains. And these guys are like two feet tall, so they would be your, your Menahuni or your leprechauns. And then they have the ant people, and the ant people would be the grades. Now they didn't call them ant people because they had eyes that looked like ants. They call them ant people because they came out of the ground, like grades having underground bases or something. And then they have the snake people, which would be what we call the reptilians. And the reptilians are the bad guys. You know, the the the, uh, the grays or the ant people are the ones that kind of like, you know, uh, they have their own agenda of what they want to do and what they're doing, but they can be also guided by the reptilians or, you know, um, the snake people. And then they have the giants, which we talked about. I talked about earlier being the tall blondes or the Nordics, and, you know. And those guys, they may have like a condo here on the, you know, on our planet, and they come in from time to time. They're the enforcer. They kind of keep everybody in check. You know, if the snake people, the reptilians, are doing something they shouldn't be doing, you know, they're gonna bitch slap them pretty much and and get them back in line. And it was like a year and a half or a couple of years later, I was talking to uh, uh, an Apache uh, elder about that, and I was just talking about, you know, the different races. And she says, oh, you mean the four? I'm going, well, really? And then she pretty much said the same thing. So when I when I, I get an opportunity to talk to, you know, an elder in the Native, in any Native American tribe, I always like to just kind of, you know, get a little information about, you know, out of their culture when it pertains to Bigfoot or aliens or UFOs and stuff. Um, so these two separate tribes, two separate people who didn't know each other, basically told me the same thing. Maybe because during you know generations, you know they, they intertwined and some of the stories intertwined. Um, the kicker for me was with alien hiring when um, I got to interview a youth, a youth elder, and I was asking this gentleman off camera, um, okay, you know we know that Native Americans have a, a name for Bigfoot. Sasquatch is one of them, and he goes, well, yeah, the Ute name is this. And I go, yeah, we know that, you know, the Star Travelers is, is our, you know, um, um, translation of a Native American name for, you know, beings coming from from outside to this planet. And then I said, the grays, and he said, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he actually mentioned the name of a, a Ute name for a gray alien. And I, and I was, that was my aha moment where, your tribe's got a name for a gray alien. Now, um, that would mean that you would know about them and you've seen them somewhere, somewhere in the history of your tribe. So um, I always find it really interesting. And, and, and your viewers out there, too, if you're ever at places where there are Native Americans out there, uh, older Native Americans, and you can talk to them. You'll, you not only will learn a lot about the history of this, of North America, but you can ask them stuff outside the realm, and uh, you know if they feel comfortable to talk with you, you know they're gonna they'll feed you some information that you're gonna go what? You know it's pretty cool stuff. It it, it was the blues, like that oh, was yeah. it was something. Never heard of that classification whatsoever ever, in in anything that I've ever read or whether online or or otherwise, and so I was a little taken aback. Um, with that, and 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 so was Dave. So well, it kind of makes it kind of makes sense though, 
Michael, because look, you know, I mean, we have leprechauns, um, you know, that are sight, even people still say they see leprechauns in, in, in the Ireland area, uh, Tommy knockers, you know, uh, when you, when you look at Tommy knockers, the, the, the old miners back in the day, you know, uh, it's, the Tommy knocker was very, very real to them. And as it turns out, I always thought it was more of a spiritual type of, uh, you know, of a thing. But no, they said they're very physical. So they would be like the leprechauns or the Manahuni, you know, here in North America. Although I apologize, um, I forgot exactly where they came from, but uh, it was a, a different ethnic group of people who came to the U.S. that were already, you know, miners and, and, and trained. Uh, people out here, you know, to be miners. And then, you know, the Manahuni, uh, when I was in Hawaii um, in April of this year, um, on the Big Island, I was talking to a couple of people. Uh, I talked to a bunch of people. Uh, and, but a couple of them came back about, yeah, we still get Manahuni sightings. Now, if you ever get a chance to go to Hawaii and you're on the, on the island of Oahu, Look up Menahuni, and there and there's actually a couple of tourist places you can go to, where the locals there say the Menahuni are responsible for making this. One of them is a bridge, you know. Menahuni is responsible for making this. Another one is like a lagoon area that uh, you know that 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 holds fresh water, you know, for the for the natives to be able to, to have fresh water all year round in case there's droughts and stuff. So there's certain places on the big uh, on the island of Oahu. There's certain places on the big island where they talk about Menahuni, but what I liked about Oahu, there's an actually a couple of tourist attractions that you can go. And and it goes back in history, like you know, this was here when you know the, the native Hawaiians migrated to you know Polynesian Islands. So it's pretty cool stuff. No? Dave? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, but I wasn't gonna I, I looked up a bunch of stuff on I still can't see Chuck, so he's frozen at a loss as to when he's going to stop uh, and take a break. So I I looked up a bunch of stuff on blues, and there's a whole bunch of stuff online that I can't get behind any of it. But if anybody wants to look it up, they're talking about like a race of people that showed up in 1954 to Florida and that they were trying to convince the government and officials to not work with the Greys because the Greys are doing the – of the bad work of, of the reptilians. And we've heard that before. That's not the first time I've heard that. I've actually heard that a lot. Um, you know, that the greys are basically just the hench, the, like the lower level thugs of the, the reptilians. Work bees. Yeah. And I think that the, yeah, I think when you said the ant, the ant reference, I got the impression that, you know, from what you see with ants is that like, they'll just, like, if they've got a goal, they just all show up and accomplish that goal. And that's kind of what I see the Greys as being. Like, I don't see them as being highly intelligent. I see them as being sent out. This is what I'm going to do. We need to go accomplish this task. A whole bunch of them show up and they get the task done. And then, you know, they move on and then a higher source takes over. Well, so I don't I, want, I, 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 Go ahead. I was going to say, yeah, I would think they're, they're, they're very intelligent. They're just... The blues or the grays are we talking about? Oh, the grays. I would okay. say the grays. Well, probably the blues too, but the grays are are very technology intelligent. I mean, it's like saying, okay, a computer isn't intelligent. Well, well, yes and no, not like a human, but yet, you know, the amount of information it stores is phenomenal. So there's some type of, a, you know, man-made intelligence there. But the, the issue is, is trying to understand why. And, you know, I mentioned it before, you know, I wrote a blog on, you know, if you want to know what an alien thinks, you have to be an alien. We really don't know. All we can do as humans is speculate why they do things the way they do and why they get things done. Now, what you're talking about, you know, they have their own agenda. They do. Look at Travis Walton, right? Him and, and you know, the, the guys, you know, the lumberjacks, right? What they were doing at the time. And he told me, if you ever mention this, make sure you get it right. We weren't clear cutting the forest, you know. <laughs> uh, know what they were doing? They were they were they were cutting the marked trees that were dying of fungus, so they wouldn't spread to other trees. And um, and as they came, you know, down after a long day's work, they saw a glow off the side. They all thought it was possibly a fire. Travis jumps out of 
out of the truck, runs over there, runs right up, but it's a giant crab sitting there. And he goes, oh, shoot. And he hides behind a log pretty much, laying. And he's hiding, and he's watching this thing sit there. How big, you know, you could feel, we could talk about this too. You can feel the electromagnetic field, you know, from, from the craft. You can feel it, you know, his hair on his arms is tingling, and he's tingling. You can feel the power. And he started to get a little worried of what would happen to him. So he stood up to take off. And when he stood up, he became a lightning rod pretty much. And so the energy, if it be EM, you know, uh, EMF, it's just like it's just like you know when you were a little kid and you had socks on, little socks or just any socks, and you you rub them against the the carpet floor, and you walk over and you zap your mom, you zap your your you know your little sister, little brother, and you arc weld them, and sometimes right. you leave a red mark on there, you burn them. Well, you know that's the same thing. He got up and and there was a discharge of energy from the craft, or the ambient energy of the craft in him, and out he went. And so they took him, and he was gone for, I forgot, four or five days, whatever it was, but they were repairing him. That wasn't their goal. Their goal was there. They were doing something in the forest, researching whatever they were doing. They were there for a different reason. He just happened to get in the way. And, and because he got hurt because of them, they took him back to another facility and, and repaired now, when he woke up and he saw them and he panicked and, you know, got out of that craft, he also saw the tall blondes or, or the giants that I talked to, you know, talked about it before with right. the four aliens. And he saw them and they were in control. They were the ones that grabbed him by the arm, slender, but yet extremely strong. And, and there's a reason for that, too. Um, and, and off he went. So uh, it looked like it. They were probably they were in control. The Greys were there, maybe doing something for them, or maybe they were doing things on their own. But you know, because you know Travis Walton got involved in what they were doing and got hurt, maybe you know they had to report it. I don't know. This is just all guesses because we really don't know how they think. But but you're right. You know, they're they're worker bees. Bees are pretty intelligent. You know, and they're they're worker bees. They know what they're doing. Uh, but if you get in the way of what they're doing, they're going to do something about it. Now, they're not compassionate. You just said, whoops, well, I better fix this. But if you get away and try to, you know, hurt them or whatever, they may go into defense mode and, you know, and then you're not around anymore. They don't think about that. It, it goes like animal mutilation. People ask me, well, well, why not just keep the animals? Well, and that's why I say if you want to think like an alien, you have to be an alien. It's, it's like, okay, so let's say aliens are mutilating animals. So they take the animal, they mutilate it, but they bring the animal back. Why? Maybe in their mind, maybe in their way of thinking, maybe the way that, that they're processing information, it's not their animal. They're just getting it back. It doesn't matter that the animal doesn't work no more, but it's not theirs. You know, they, but they don't understand. Maybe they, they just don't, because like you said, they're worker bees. They're doing what they're, they're doing, and they just okay, I'm done with it. You know, and you know that. How many times have, have 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 someone in your family opened up something, you know, outside and, uh, and out of the refrigerator and looked at all the counter and let it sit there? Well, I'm done with it. Well, put it away when you're done. Well, I'm just done with it, so I'm, I'm leaving, you know, or whatever. You know, have it. We do it all the time. So, see, so you brought up an interesting topic here with aliens and this is something i and, and with travis walton and i think this is something that hardly ever gets discussed so i want to i want to kind of throw this out there to you what what is your take on aliens healing people and do you think that that's part of their agenda you personally do you think that there is and i don't know if it's a specific race let's just say it's not a specific race let's just say it's it's common across visitors from outer space that they're not here to hurt mankind they're here to help us and if something like that happens if they were doing something and somebody like travis accidentally stumbled across it and got hurt in the process that they were like well look at that's not our goal right it wasn't our goal to hurt this human being you know but now we need to take him back and we need to make sure he's okay do you think there's other instances of that happening around in the world with, with alien encounters? Yes and no. I mean, yes 
and then know that, that I've seen the opposite. Where, where it's more like harming versus helping? Well, well, I mean, there are cases of human mutilations. So um, it, it has to do with the agenda. And, and this is the agenda. And if you think, if you think like, a, like a robot would think, right? And like I said, this is still speculation. You know, everybody, you know, it, it could be anybody's, you know, call on this. But if you're programmed to do something and something gets in the way, and okay, and I got to fix what got in the way, right? Um, and that would have been Travis Walton. But then are they here? They're here to their benefit, in my opinion, not our benefit. And over the years, I've always, you know, I, I of course, it's, it's the certain groups of individuals that, that talk about they're here to protect us. They're here to, well, they've done a lousy job of doing it, you know, <laughs> protecting us. You know, if they were here to protect us, we would have the vaccine. There would have been a COVID issue. So, no, that's not the issue. Um, and if that was the issue, you know, there would have atomic bombs. We would, you know, but, but then again, we wouldn't be the species we are. We'd be a controlled species. We would be, you know, nothing but lab rats. Uh, control controlling our lives every day. Um, so my opinion, they're here to 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 research, um, to to see what we're doing, to see how we evolve and what we do next. And and you know, and if we blow each other up, that'll be a paper they're going to write or whatever you know. But um, but in certain cases, they they there is communication involved for where for whatever reasons you know they'll communicate with the objectives for whatever reasons you know they'll. The objective may come back from an experience and say, you know what? I used to have a tinnitus and now I don't, or something like that. Or, or they were they were, you know, you know, healed. Maybe that was part of the medical examination. Oh, look, you know, while we're examining like us, right? So so you know, we 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 capture a, a coyote or something and we take it in and and we want to check it and do a blood samples on it to see uh, you know, if there's any toxins in the forest at this coyote, make sure that there's, you know, there's nothing else like, you know, uh, uh, any type of viruses or diseases that can be transferred over to humans. And while they're doing that, checking it out, do an x-ray and go, hey, this coyote's got a big tumor right here. Well, let's just take it out. We're going to release them again. We'll just fix them. We'll take out you know, this tumor right here. And and so the coyote gets re you know, released and he's got stitches on this side. <laughs> he goes, oh, what the hell happened? You know, you never knew we had a tumor in them. So, I mean, it could be something that simple. There could be some compassion, but, you know, compassion is a human trait. So we have to be really careful about how we perceive aliens to think. We have to make sure that we don't imply human thinking, human responses on an alien. You have to, you know, just look at it as, as a blank piece of paper, you know. And, and and not as as you know something else. Well, you know, this right is it isn't this. Even though we may, we may want to think that that's the blank sheet of paper, it's not. No, we could make it that way, but you know we really don't know. Anyway, I mean, if they were here to help us, or maybe they have helped us, and we just don't understand it yet because our level of thinking of them helping us. We would think, okay, it's this and that or that and this. Maybe it's something else. Maybe they, maybe the Earth was going to slow down its rotation and they've already fixed that. We never would know. Right? Fair point. So I have, um, so I think on Friday into Saturday, um, or this this weekend anyway, uh, we put a poll out on uh, the Instagram page. Uh, specifically for for this show, and the 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 results were very interesting. But just the very first question I'm going to ask you about, and and it was simply, do aliens exist? And you know, there there were 23 votes in the 24 hour period that this happened. 19 said yes, four of them said no. Do you? still encounter people who are like, no, we're the only people in the universe and, you know, extraterrestrials don't exist at all or they can't exist or, you know, whatever the reasoning is. So do you encounter those people still? And if you do, what do you say to them? Well, a lot of times, the majority of times, the people 
that are like that. And I don't want to say they're not free, free thinkers. And the reason why I say they're not free thinkers is, is because they're so closed loop in what they believe in and what they were taught. Um, let's talk about, you know, the, the people out there that still talk about the flat earth, the flat earth theories, right? Um, well, the earth's not flat. We know that. But yet you can't convince someone who is a flat earth theorist that the earth is round. Well, it's not really round. It's more egg-shaped. But the thing is, you know, you're not going to win that argument. And, but what I've seen in cases like that, the people that respond like, no, there's no aliens, are usually ones that, are, that have a, a, a particular type of religious background. And um, and they take their religion verbatim, you know, I mean, it, what it says, what it says, what it says. They don't read between the lines. I'm not saying they're not any less intelligent. I'm just saying um, they just need to be more open. These are the people that usually get hit by a car when they're walking across the street looking at their cell phone and don't realize that they're, they're walking against the red light. You know, they, they don't have a green light. They don't, they don't see beyond what they're focused on and what they're focused on in their life is what they're focused on. Uh, yes, there's, 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 there's extraterrestrial life outside this planet. It's teams with extra. Matter of fact, it, and I had a, I had a, it's funny because I had a, uh, like a physicist. Well, he was, I, I don't know exactly what his background was, but it was in physics that he was saying it was really interesting. It was years and years ago that based on what we know, Evolution now, okay. Well, I'm talking evolution now. For those people who don't believe in evolution, forget what I'm saying. <laughs> so, um, so based on evolution, the odds, the percentage, which is great. It's a great, you know. It's not. I mean, well, it's a small percentage, but the odds were really against us that life would actually start on this planet the way it started, and we as humans would end up here, you know, and not Howard the Duck, right? And humans, right? So the odds, the percentage was so great that the odds are greater that life exists outside this planet than on this planet. And it makes you think, wait, wait, wait a minute, we, we have life on this planet. No, no, yeah, look at it. Look at the percentage, look at the odds of what it took to start life on this planet. The odds are greater <laughs> outside this planet because of all the billions and billions of other suns that have planets and all the places we know nothing about, we can only see as far as our telescope can, 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 can see light reflecting black, you know, back, what's beyond that, right? So I, I, you know, when you look at it that way, it, from, from a statistic analysis look, then life is a lot greater than, than on this planet. So yeah, it's, you know, the universe is out there when you when you look at the Hubble Space Telescope, and I know they're having problems with it now, but it's, it is outdated. But remember, when it first came out, it showed just man, there's like four or five hundred, you know, six or seven, maybe even thirty different little galaxies. In one place, there they said like a hundred different galaxies. Well, those are spiral galaxies. That's what we live in. So each one of those little dots that are spiral galaxies have billions and billions of planets on. How can we not say there's no life out there? Once again, we're going back to the 14th, 15th century Copernicus time where we're saying that the earth is the center of, of all existing life, that, that if you say that we're rotating, that we're moving around the sun and the sun's not moving around us, we're going to behead you. That's why all that information had to come out after these guys, Galileo and, and Copernicus, you know, talked about it because they were they're going to get killed for, for, for you know, blasphemy pretty much. Um, that's 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 our culture. That's who we are. And so now you have scientists today that still do the same thing. Now you have people today saying, what you see is what you get. Well, it's really unfortunate, but that's not the case because we'll never know, ever, 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 ever know what's beyond, beyond, right? Where does space end? It doesn't end. It's infinity. The Big Bang Theory, they're, they're saying, well, the Big Bang, it's expanding. Okay. That's one of billions of Big Bangs all over the place. We're just looking at our Big Bang. Our Big Bang isn't everything, and that's where modern-day science fails, and they're the ones that are creating this same thing, same thinking, telling the people that our Big Bang is, is the Big Bang because it's ours and we came up with this idea. No, 
Yeah, if there was a big bang here, there's a big bang over there, and a big bang over there, a big bang, or maybe it wasn't a big bang, and you know what I mean. So, gotta yeah. think wider. Right, they're just calling it something different. So the they're other intelligence, it, right? It's not a big yeah. bang to them. It was some whatever word they use for it, but yeah. it's the same experience, is what we're saying. I mean, really, seriously. I mean, how many times do you have have your viewers just late at night and look at the stars and go, "What's beyond that?" And then what's beyond that? And then what's beyond that? And what's beyond that? And what's beyond that? And what's beyond that? What's and this is a sun? Is it a brick wall? What's on the other side of the brick wall? You know, we are not at that level of intelligence yet to understand even a fraction of what's going on in space, let alone saying life doesn't exist. That's just you know beyond. I mean, that's just kind of like ignorant thinking. And I apologize for those people who say that, but you know, you really got to get out, you know, you know, um, and because there's stuff out there that's happening in your backyard that you are totally unaware of, if that's what you think, because there's all kinds of scary shit happening out there. But then, then you got dimensions, right? You know, not only do you have space, but now you have inner dimensions in between space. Quantum mathematics or physics says there's 11 dimensions, and in between 11 dimensions is infinite amount of dimensions, and here we go again. I don't think it's just a I just not stars. So it's crazy. <laughs> that it is. Yeah, I know. I'm surprised. I got that, <laughs> that uh that you got nineteen out of twenty three, and I know that's that's a very segmented, obviously, because that's eighty three percent. And I would I would venture to bet that if you would be nowhere near that that it would be 83 percent of people who don't believe well, in aliens because you know, right right now what wait a minute right now you got to take, take a look that in the most recent most recent survey that 60 percent of america that six percent of society sorry i don't 60 percent of society in general believes in ghosts or spirits i would find it hard to believe that 83 percent believe in aliens but only 60 percent believe in ghosts yeah, I would think that um, that number would be substantially less. There should be 100% believe life exists outside this planet. Done. There should be no less than 100%. Anybody who Which, thinks less It should be the same way with spirits, though, too. Well, right? well spirits, though, that, that could depend upon your, your religious background. Because if you were brought up, too, as, as you know, it is what it is, then you have to deal with that, which is the same thing that we get with, you know. Now, you know, and I know that there's spirits out there, and and uh, and I believe they're interdimensional. They can come back as, forth as, as they please, and you don't need someone, you know, to, to force them out. But um, I, I, I obviously am on board with that. But when it comes to life outside this planet, um, it's, it's really hard to say, there's absolutely nothing other than us out of the gazillion, bajillion, whatever, make up a number, you know, right. of, of other uh, galaxies out there that doesn't harbor any type of intelligent life. You know, that's old, old school thinking. And this is the 21st century now, so we really have to step it up a bit. Our science now has to step it up due, due to June 25th. Now they got to create technology to try and figure out what's flying over us and try to figure out what that technology is that we can identify at this point. I can't say it's alien until you know, we know it's alien, but we don't know yet. But it's not technology that we're aware of. Those spirits, I've, I've always, I've always believed in life after death. But there's some people out there that you know that don't believe in life after death, so they're just they're just cut off. Right. Uh, you know that's but like you said, you know. You can't convince those people. You can't persuade them. The best you can do is just say, "Look, this is this is what I found. This is what I do. I've communicated with the afterlife. We're still trying to understand what the afterlife is. Uh, we have an idea, but you know, as we get more experience, as we go further, we'll know more. Same thing with UFOs too. It's like saying, remember how many years ago was it where?" Um, there were no other class three planets out there. Remember that? 
you have to go way back to a few years when you were young. They're going, nah, there's, we haven't found another class three planet. We haven't found any planets similar to ours. Now they're in the thousands because of technology. And they're constantly, but they just found a planet recently. They found a star recently that they believe the planets that are harboring that star, this is just within the last week, they say they have Earth-like um, uh, possibilities. So as our technology increases, so will our science, right? And it, it's hand in hand, but you know, um, the bottom line is, is we'll know more about you know outside our planet as we get a little bit better in what we're doing. You know, geez, you know, if you were in the, in, in, in uh, Salem, right, and, you, and you, you came in there and you were a time traveler and you lit up a cigarette with a big lighter, they would burn you at the stake for being a witch. You know, so eventually they And they'd realize. use your big lighter to do it. And they <laughs> use your, oh, yeah. Now, Better have, have a Zippo, man. Don't have a Bic. If you're going to get burned to death with your own lighter, get a really nice Zippo that's like something, you know, engraved with something that you really feel passionate about. There you go. So, all right. So here's a question for you, right? Class three planets. Why does a planet have to be Earth-like in order for us to deem it possible that there could be life on it? How arrogant is that? That is very arrogant. Right? And, I mean, because uh, why in the hell does it have to be an Earth? Why does it have to be Earth in order to have an intelligent life form on it? Because that's, that's that's a disturbing the, thought. That's a totally that's disturbing thought to me. That's the way our science thinks, unfortunately. Not all scientists. You know, there's there's a couple out there now that are thinking way out of the box. I mean, look at one AU, one astronomical unit, right? It's a distance between here and sun, right? They they still use Earth as a base model for everything. Um, it was kind of fun because about a month or so ago, no, it was yeah, June. It was just after this got released. Um, I was on a Russian news show. Mm -hmm. This was like this would be just a like like Fox News Live. This was this was a news show for Russian speaking people all over the world, not just in the U.S. And it didn't it didn't run in Russia, but the run but the, the people of Russia could watch it on, uh, on on the you know internet. So they had me go on. I was I, I was going on live, and I was and I had like fifteen minutes. And then I was on, I was on, I was listening to the last guy finish up and he was running a little late and he was a Russian physicist, right? And they were asking him questions about this and that. And I'm going, oh my God, this guy, he's old school. And it's really sad that when, when you have people of this caliber, very intelligent, that are still thinking like it's, you know, 16th century. 17th century thinking. I call it Renaissance thinking, right? That's probably early that 14th century. Mm -hmm. So um, so after he was off, and they said, hey, this is where I learned how to pronounce my last name. So it's not Zukowski, it's Zukowski. Uh, and I like that, Zukowski, because it sounds you know, sounds tougher. Zukowski. Intimidating. It sounds intimidating. Yeah, we yeah, have Chuck Zukowski. And that's how I was, I was brought on. I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. And um, and he says, well, we just got, you know, basically finished talking with, you know, Professor so-and-so. And he was talking about how, you know, SETI, you know, they're, and, and how they're looking for, uh, you know, uh, radio waves and, and then how they're looking for, uh, um, now they, we've stepped it up. Now we're looking for, you know, maybe hydrogen or nitrogen and, and we're using these different filters. And, and he says, what do you think about that? And I said, what? Well, that's old school thinking. And he kind of, and I said, I said, this is this is way way old school. This is where scientists like that fail. And he goes, and he didn't know what to what to say. Yeah, I could see his eyes just kind of popped because they had, you know, his, the camera was on him, and uh, and on me. And, and and I said, look, these guys are old school thinking. They're trying to find planets out there that are harboring human life that evolved just like us. And I said, that's where they fail. I said, there's life just out there everywhere. We have to be creative to find a life that is not like us, right? That did not exactly evolve exactly, exactly, exactly like us. There was even one scientist a couple of years back that said, well, the only way that anything could, could actually travel to this planet would have to be bipods like us and have fingers and, 
and be able to build stuff. And I'm going, I'm sorry, is this a 50s B-rated science fiction movie I'm watching? You know, I mean, do, you know, um, retire because you're not helping us at all with that type of thinking. And that's the same thing. So basically, I, you know how I ran and rave, right? So I was ratting and raving. And I was tearing this guy apart, just tearing him apart. And then the voice came over my my speakers and said, "I'm sorry, we had to cut you off. You ran out." <laughs> and no, they cut me off because I was just destroying, you know, the professor and and what he said because I I listened to you know his last ten minutes of it, and I guess they didn't like it. But I was using reason. And uh, you know, against against his, you know, uh, with you know, methodologies, <laughs> not methodologies, myth, myth, <laughs> ologies, and uh, we can't, we, we don't, no, 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 we can't believe that everything's going to be bipedal like us. Uh, we can't believe, we can't look for life on planets. That's a good way of starting. Go with what you know. Fine. Okay. So they can say, well, we haven't found any life on this planet yet. Be specific. We have not found any life on any planet that's like us. Right. And they always leave like us out. And that's where they fail. So, um, Well, that's part of our arrogance as a human race. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, Absolutely. hands down, right? I mean, we're, we're the epitome of our own universe. Uh, it, you know, not all of us, but a majority of the thinkers that are disseminating information, you know, and I put thinkers in air quotes, a majority yeah. of the thinkers that are disseminating information to the population in general, that's their mentality. So it's hard mm -hmm. unless you get on kind of fringe topics and kind of like what we do on this podcast, what other podcasts do and stuff like that, is that we're taking a look at it from this angle and this angle and this angle and this angle. And we're looking past the mediocrity and looking more for what are the potential. I don't care if it's a, a one one hundred millionth of a percent. Mm -hmm. It's still a, it's still a potential, right? There's still potential there, so it still needs to be discussed. It still mm -hmm. needs to be explored. It still mm -hmm. needs to be thought about, because that's where our next great find is going to come from. And maybe not something that infinitesimal, but it's going to be something that is not. It's going to be something that's going to come from a different angle. I guarantee you that, because I think I think in in our society and in our since recorded time, I think some of the greatest things that we've ever accomplished or understood happened from an angle that nobody was looking, that nobody was expecting. And somebody saw it from a different perspective and said, wait a second, what about this? Right? Good, good. Very, very good point. I mean, you look at the Wi-Fi right now that we're using. Yeah. Nikola Tesla, late right. 1800. That's what it was. And because now using Wi-Fi, we can recharge, we can do all kinds of stuff on Wi-Fi. We talked about that in the late 1800s. So it's, uh, you know, and there was a lot of people that were against him too, but you're you're absolutely right. We we are very very as a species self centered. I mean, okay, all those yahoos out there, and you know who you are. Now, when I'm sitting at a at a, at a light to make a left turn, and I get the green arrow, and you a holes keep going, forcing me to sit there and wait, you know, and you're running red lights, making your turn in front of me. It's because you guys think you're better than me. Right, but that's how our society is. Right, all right. privilege. All that's right. the term I use. I'm yeah. better than you, and I'm going to run this red light because that's what I'm going to do. Well, you know what? One of these days, I hope we can do a Mad Max run. <laughs> you know, we all drive around with, uh, yeah, you because know, I so many times I'm like, man, I would just. And what I do with those guys is I'm in a pickup truck, and when I get that green light, I go. Now, I'm not going to hit them. But I force them to stop at an intersection. I honk at them. I make them look like a complete idiot. That's, but that's me. You know, I have my own little quirks too of people who blatantly break the law because they think they're better. But that's what we have with science also. So we have these scientists who say, "Well, we we're better than you because we have, you know, we went to Harvard, or we went to where Oxford, and we have our degrees, and we know better than you, and we know that we that this is what we have to do to find life." But they're very, very tunnel vision. All they see is what they see, you know, for themselves and what they want to do for themselves, like the guys that make the turns in front of you. You know, that's all they see. They don't see the bigger picture. They don't see 
the possibilities, the probabilities of other types of life. They don't see that these guys making left turns are keeping other people, you know, and you know, from turning and and then they're gonna get stuck behind the light. They got away for another light because of these guys. So I mean it's it's that methodology or not the methodology, that's us, you know, that's a society we we have right now. And that's why you have some people going, Well, there's no life outside this planet. Well, why? Because there's none. Explain. Well, there's none, or because I know it's not. How do you know there's not? Give me some information. Give me something that says the reason why, you know, there's no life. Well, because this book says and this here that there's no life. Oh, okay. So you're basing everything off of fiction, you know, or right. science fiction, I should say. Right. You know? Yeah. That's annoying. But anyway. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so, uh, I don't think there's enough time for this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway because I really want to know. Um, so one of the one of the um, last interviews that you you did with us, and I think this was after the case, uh, you know, after the show, and you said something that I had never, I'd never like contemplated before, and I've, I've been looking into it ever since, and that was uh, you were talking about whether you know when people believe they're having a spirit experience like a personal experience in their home and, and stuff like that and 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 they believe that it's some sort of spirit or let's just say demon or human spirit you know whatever it is beer but you had asked the question you know what you know how would they react if they're not you know if they found out that they're not having a spirit experience but an alien experience that it, that it's an extraterrestrial that that is causing whatever you know experience that they're having and not and not a ghost spirit whatsoever i have been trying ever since then to to try and find a way to distinguish the two to be able to take claims from clients or whatever and be able to be like okay that seems more extraterrestrial than it does spirit and I've asked many, many people, and nobody can give me an answer as to maybe some things that I, I could look for, or that people in general, maybe just par you know, paranormal investigators can, can can look for, where they may be able to distinguish between the two. Do you have any like any advice or any insight into what to look for? Well, real real quick. Um the first thing I look at is any type of physical evidence on the person who's making the claims. Because with abductees or people who've been visited, sometimes there's actually scars, marks on them. Um, other things, bruises, maybe not so much bruises, but the, you know, scars or, or, or something inside of with those, you know, with no entry scars. Something that, that as ghost investigators, you say, you know what, that normally doesn't happen. You know, they, you know, if you, usually when people are physically attacked, it doesn't look like they were surgically, you know, scoop marks and stuff like that. And that's that's obviously that's an obvious one. Other things too is residual, you know, you know, electromagnetic field. You know, someone says they saw something come through the wall, and you go back there, and you can pick up an EM field. You can pick up a residual EM field. Uh, generally, spirits may not leave a residual EM field where it might be more technology. Then you look, then you look. You add to that talking to people around, uh, you know, that house or wherever. Have they had any UFO sightings? Anything's happened, and you know, outside that you, maybe you could tie that into. But generally, I've been doing enough of these now where just the explanation, just the witness testimony itself now, um, can tell me the difference between what's spiritual and and what's what's alien like. Because I've been doing so many UFO investigations, it's almost their testimony themselves how they describe what happened to them what they see you know and then they then and then the nightmares they have afterwards that that uh, you know of, of being not so much taken but you know things doing to them against their will usually that's not usually the case in you know in in society special sightings or or you know unless it's demonic or something but you can you know that's history you can you can pick that up on so um yeah, I, I know we only like a, like a minute left, and there's a lot, really a lot that you have to look at. That's why I got involved in, in ghost investigations, so I could differentiate between the two. 
And at first it was a little difficult. And then the more you do it, the more you realize, oh yeah, I can see, you know, and then you look at other evidence, like I said, outside, you know, other people have sightings outside, balls of light, all kinds of stuff like that. Balls of light are not orbs. Orbs are not balls of light, two separate things. One's mechanical, one's spiritual. So once you figure that out, you got that part nailed. Perfect. Um, all right. Uh, thank you, Chuck, obviously, for coming on for these last two hours. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, brilliant as always. <laughs> you know, uh, Dave's right. You know, we learn something every time that you're on. And um, I also want to put out there that obviously you are going to be part of the Vegas Pair Unity Convention happening in December. So, you know, we'll, Dave and I will. Uh, we'll, we will see you there. But uh, if anybody wants to get a hold of you, uh, just at, ask you a question or, or see what you're up to, how can they do that? Just go to ufonut.com. My website, ufonut.com. And right at the top, it says email. And that goes directly to my personal email. And um, I'd like to thank everybody out there for listening to me. I'd like to thank you also for listening to me rat and rave. You know, about the people turning left in front of me and stuff. I mean, happens to us all the day, but I was trying to make a point of, of how our minds think um, and, uh, you know, as society at this point, which is also reflecting on science at this, you know, at this point, because it's, it's all social issues. Um, I'm not trying to target anybody in particular, race, religion, or, or car driver. <laughs> <laughs> Damn <Perfect>. car drivers. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, well, that does it here for us this week. Uh, join us next week when we will have the great Ronnie LeBlanc from uh, Expedition Bigfoot. He will be coming on during that second hour. Uh, greatly looking forward to talking with him. And uh, yeah, so stay healthy, stay safe. Get your vaccine if you haven't yet. We want to see you back here next week. Chuck, thank you. Everybody have a great night. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>